Hello, Miss Erica. How are you? I'm well. How about yourself? I am doing very, very, very good. I am so happy to have you with us tonight. Um, I'm going to call this an exclusive because I know that this is going to be your first time publicly sharing your story. And I'm so, so very happy that you are doing that with us here on The Private Room. Um, so please tell us um, who Erica is, what do you do for a living, um, and how did you get to this point where you are ready to share your story? Well, I, I am Erica A. Meadows. I'm from Durham, North Carolina. Um, I am I'm a realist. So I'm pretty kind of blunt, straightforward. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it. Um, and I am recently a published author. So my first book is coming out November 8th. Um, so I'm excited about that. It's a poetry book and that's what I do. I'm a poet. Um, I do plan on taking on writing assignments and doing an autobiography. Um, I just was able to leave one of my long-term abuse just over a month ago, coming up on two months now. So um, the whole healing thing is just, all of this is new for me. So I'm deciding to share my story for me and other people who may be going through something similar and not know how to get out of it. Yes, um, I know that when we first met, I, told you, I believe the last time that you were last week when you were on the um, on with us that I was feeling something in my heart. There was some energy there and I wasn't quite sure um, what that energy was, but I know that I kept coming back to Erica and saying, are you ready? Are you ready to do, do your poetry? Can you come out tonight? What's going on with you? And just something just kept pulling me back to you. Um, and so I, we, I, we figured it out what it was. And <laughs> that's because we have some um, experiences that we both have shared. And one of those experiences is domestic violence. Um, we know that domestic violence um, can happen not only with your um, intimate partner, but it can happen between family members from from you know, parents, from children, grandparents, cousins, neighbors, and so forth. So it doesn't have to be somebody that you're in an intimate relationship with, but it can be somebody else who, um, a, who is your your father, your mother, um, your neighbor, your teacher. There are all different ways um, or all different forms of domestic violence, and it's not exclusive to one set of people. Right. So. Your story um, is definitely one that is um, not commonly heard, but is common um, for various reasons. And we're going to find that out tonight. Um, tell us about your poetry, because that was how we originally met through Jonathan Coleman. So tell us about your poetry. Um, my poetry, I've been writing for some years. Um, just decided to kind of go public with some of it. Um, reason being, I had shared um, a couple of my early writings with my mom and mm -hmm. <clears throat> she knew what I was speaking about. So her thing was, why would you want to tell everybody? You right. know, mm -hmm. um, so I sat on it, right? Mm -hmm. So I decided, why not tell everybody? I didn't do anything wrong, you know? So right. I kept writing though, you know, I kept writing, I kept, it was, it was kind of a dream for me at one point to just kind of write like that. And mm -hmm. I finally composed some together. I got with my publisher, Juanita Woodson, and mm -hmm. she said, I can help you. you know, she said she needed, I don't know, maybe about seven more poems to complete the book. I got those done over a week, a couple of days, and here we are. Yes, yes. So tell about your book. What's the name of it? And kind of what is the the overall theme of your book? Well, it's, it's again, it's, the name of it is Dimensions of Me. Um, and it um, 
basically it goes through, you know, you'll, you'll find, um, healing poems in there to help you heal. You'll find angry. <laughs> you'll find yeah. a little bit of risque, <laughs> just a tad. I only have one of those, one or two of those. Um, but, you know, Dimensions of Me, I what it says is there's many layers, just a glimpse inside of the soul, healing and evolving, coming herself, releasing negative energy and people, only growth and spiritual awakening, awakening and clarity. So that's what this book is in a nutshell. Nice. Um, what prompted you to write this particular book? I felt like it was the beginning of a healing process for myself. Um, even though I was still in the midst of a bunch of nonsense, um, I still found myself wanting to heal, trying to heal, understanding that I was chosen to break these generational curses. And so I take that responsibility seriously. And so my goal is to heal, not just for me, but for anybody that has gone through it, that is going through it, um, that's having trouble trouble healing themselves. You know, I, I can't heal them directly. I don't have that kind of power. I wish I did right. kind of power, but I can definitely help and encourage it. Will. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. Um, so I want to start with, like some background history. Tell us about your childhood and how that was for you. Um, growing up was difficult. My father is a narcissist um, and he's very, very controlling, very manipulative um, to the point where, you know, this is my house, you're going to do what I say regardless you know your opinion doesn't matter um i remember if my mother maybe even said some things in a general group of couples um he wouldn't hit her then in front of everybody he's a closet abuser so you know when the door closes you know what's coming mm -hmm. um <clears throat> so uh but he would okay we gotta go and we will leave and then the door when we got home and I would hear, you know, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't always see, but there were times that I did. Um, when I was younger, I don't know how old I was. We lived in Salem at the time. I'm trying to even figure if I was even school age, but that was, I remember that being the first time I saw him actually hit her. <clears throat> and I thought they were playing because she was in front of him holding her waist and I thought it was a smile but it was really a cry when I looked up at it and he threw on the and he hit her twice. and <clears throat> and I was like um I said daddy that's not nice you know um because like I said I was young I said daddy that's not nice I said mommy come on get up girl I don't know I didn't know what else to do <clears throat> so I don't remember what happened after that um but that was the first time that I actually saw it and how old were you then? I'm thinking maybe five, maybe six. But she said that he started when I was two to do that to her. They had already been married two years. And I, I get it. I'm not saying that what he did or how he acted was okay because it definitely wasn't. And I'm not here to throw him under the bus. What I'm here to do is show the signs of a narcissist, show the signs of an abuser, show the signs of um, a controlling, manipulative person that can take you down the wrong path. That's what I'm here to do. And <clears throat> my mother grew up seeing the same thing. So you see how the cycle went, right? So mm -hmm. she grew up with her grandparents um, mistreating each other. And then she got into a marriage that did it. And my first marriage was abusive as well. So, um, I mean, she grew up with her. Hmm. No, go ahead. I'm listening. <laughs> yeah. So, so my first marriage was, was extremely abusive as well. Um, so 
growing up was difficult, you know, and my mother will look at me to this day and say, uh, I know you better than you know you. I'm like, I need you. You know the Erica that was created, that who you know. Um, she no longer exists. You know, I'm working really hard to get rid of her. I'm working really hard to be the adult advocate for the little girl who needed somebody. So right. that is my goal at this point. That's what I'm working so hard to do. Yeah. Um, you said that you started seeing or witnessing abuse um, when you were about two years old, and that was against your mom. Were there other siblings in the house? Not at that time. I was the only child for almost 11 years. My okay. the brother didn't come until I was 10 and a half. Okay. Okay. Um, and so from two years old to 10 years old, did you experience any abuse at that time? Or when did the abuse started? When did the abuse start targeting you? As I got into my teenage years more so, but there was, I mean, there was abuse when I was, because I remember one time we were living outside of Winston-Salem. I was in elementary school. So at this point I may have been in fourth grade, maybe fifth, mm -hmm. working on math. And I had called my mom to help me, but she didn't come. He came and that's when I knew what had gone on because she always when I called her, unless it was that. So he came and he helped me with the problem. It was the number six that went under, you know, it was double, um, double addition. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the, it, whatever it was, it was the number six. That's all I remember needed to go right up underneath these two numbers. And he said, no, that's not straight you need to erase it and put it under there correctly. Mm -hmm. And I erased it. I did it like three times. And finally I said, it's under there, right? I don't know how else you want me to put it under there is what I said to him. And he smacked the back of my head so hard. Mm -hmm. um, he said, erase it and do it again. I said, I just started crying. You know what I mean? And I erased it <laughs> and I did it again, hoping that was it and I wouldn't get hit again. You know, um, and I didn't, he didn't hit me again. I don't remember what I do remember that, event, but I don't remember if he walked away or if he said something or I don't remember. Um, so yeah, that that's, there were little things like that. I think even spank, spanking me or finding reasons to spank me was a thing for him too, because I listened to what, what, how he did my brothers when they were growing up, because I have two. Um, and it was never as, I don't want to say rageful, because that's, that's, that gives you the wrong impression, but it was never maybe so intense and so many times that they got hit, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, he hit them with a, with a, like he's a cap on. So he might have hit them with that paddle maybe three times, mm -hmm. but hit me with anything other than his hand. And, but that was bad enough if you get hit in the same spot over and over and over and over. Mm -hmm. It was, it was like he stopped when his hand hurt or something, you know what I mean? So right. as, we, as I got older, um, we, I graduated high school and we moved to South Georgia where he opened uh, Frank. Because we were not near the family. We didn't know him in New Jersey. He had been up there in open and, and looking for us. He knew a few people here and there. We knew nobody. Um, mm -hmm. So the thing for me to do was to go work in his store um, since I wasn't going to school. And um, so, so I did. But that was really, he lost it. Every, I mean, it was almost an everyday thing with my mother for whatever reason. And I would try at that point, I'm like, I'm old enough to be 
something and do something, say something. That's when I would get it. You know, there were times when I got it when she wasn't around. She feels as though my mother, when I say she feels like uh, he never did anything to you. But he did. I told her, you don't always know. You weren't always around. Um, mm-hmm. I'm not believing that or not, but it is what it is. Right. Right. Um, for you, um, so your other sibling was a sister or brother? I have two younger brothers. Two younger brothers. So I know that experiences can be different for um, female children versus um, male children. So did they also become subjects of abuse as well? They did. They did. Mm-hmm. But you know, they're, they're boys. So as they got older, their defense mechanisms kicked in. You know, one of my brothers, the one just below me, um, passed away in 2018, but he had anger issues. He had, you know, he literally jack my father up once like you will not do this to me again you know so like i said it's a little different because when they get to a certain certain age they can do things that me as a female i just can't do to him you know um so yeah it it was i'm pretty sure it was different to an extent i'm pretty sure my father did more to me because i was female and he knew he could probably get away with you know Mm -hmm. yes yeah um, I know that you said when you were younger that there were times when he would hit you and then um, whether you blacked out or, or blocked it out, you know, you're not sure the extent at some times, but as you were getting older, did the, the forms of abuse change? Because it sounds as if um, it was a lot of mental and verbal abuse and there was also some physical abuse so um what was what was his normal or should i say yeah well i'm gonna say normal because this is was his character yes what was normal towards you was it more physical was it more mental and and the same question for your mom and your siblings early for me early on it was more verbal and emotional, you're not anything. You're not going. You know, you're not going to be anything. You're not going to do anything. You know, you know. I didn't want to go to his big thing is go to college, and her, my mom's big thing was go to college. I was like, I want the university setting isn't for me. I'm kind of a community type, you know. Um, and grandparent um, that was. That was when, in his mind, he decided. I that I wasn't going to. Um, and as far as my mother, honestly, I can, I don't know if it was ever um, sexual, um, honestly, but it, I can, I don't know if it was ever physical. You know, it was definitely physical. Um, he downgraded her, he demeaned her, he talked nasty to her, he's I know he spit on her, threw coffee in her face, you know, slammed her, her um, fingers in drawers. Um, he would literally take a pillow and smother her until she would fight to like get off. I'm like, daddy, get off of her, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas I thought it was kind of playful then, mm-hmm. it wasn't, you know. Um, as far as my brothers are concerned, by the time I'm I'm significantly older than my brothers. So by the time they really experienced some stuff, I was gone. So I, I left. Mm-hmm. Not sure exactly what they went through. I know that my mother um, got with her current husband and moved to the D.C. area. And um, they went to court. They divorced. He ended up with custody of the boys, but the boys didn't want to move to D.C. They chose to stay where they were familiar, which was with him, which was probably not the best thing to do, but they did it. Right. You know, they endured some down talking. My youngest brother told me, you know, yeah, you know, he talked he talked crap to me too. But I think it's it's kind of like my my father probably messed with me up until the day that I moved because of the reaction he liked the reaction he would get from me. And so what I have to learn and I'm still learning 
is not be so reactive to him at all. Just kind of ignore him, you know, um, because he enjoys the reaction, obviously. Right, right. And that's that's sad that, well, let me ask you, what was your reaction? What was your reaction that you feel that he enjoyed? The negative one, the re, you know, the kind of knee jerk, like, you know, because I never talked to him with respect. And I, I, I haven't because I lost that years ago. I would, you know, I, I don't even know if I can say what I said to him, but it, you know, it was always a foul name, you know, and it was me kind of just going off like on a tirade, you know, just kind of just snapping off. And he enjoys that reaction. He, you know, that's the type of person he is. Right. Um, so whatever he can do to try to trigger that is what he does. Yeah. If, if I still allow it, he would still do it. Right. Um, so after you moved out, did you continue a relationship? Because this is your biological father, correct? It is. Okay. Did you continue a relationship with him after that? He's dead to me. Understood. Understood. And is he still alive today? Yes. Okay. When was the last time you talked to him? Um, I said something to him. It's been a long time. Because even the last time I saw him, I didn't say anything. He, mm -hmm. I, I think when we were still living there, my son had picked me up from work and we had driven into the neighborhood. And when you go into the neighborhood, you can see our house right away because we're at the top of the neighborhood and or Granny's house because that's where we were staying. And um, we saw him there. And I said, well, he's there. And so, so um, we're going to block. <laughs> we have to get our mind straight because we don't know what he's coming for. You know what I mean? We don't know what he's got, agenda is. excuse me, what his agenda is. So we rode around the block a little bit and we came back and he was still standing outside the door. There's a lockbox there for Granny in case she's there by herself and the emergency people need to get in. Um, he's been told several times how to get in that box and pull the key. Um, he said, I got out the car, we, we parked, we got out the car. And um, this is at your house, right? This, where you were living? This is at Granny's house where we were Okay. Living. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, and Granny is his mother. Okay. Right. Okay. So got out the car and um, he said, Mommy, say, my son said, Mom, go ahead, unlock the door. I said, Okay. So I went on, had the key. Um, and he said, I opened the lockbox, but there was no key in it. I didn't say anything. And I went and put the, the key in the lock, turned it. And he said, Well, how are you doing? I didn't say anything. I opened the door. I said, hey, Granny, how you doing? She said, hey, I was trying to make it to the door because she was trying to let him in, get to the door to let him in. I said, I got the door. You relax, catch your breath. Everything's fine. She said, whew, well, I'm glad you're here. And I went, took off my shoes, went on upstairs and did what I usually do in the evening. I didn't say a word to him. Um, so as far as I'm concerned, we don't speak. You know, I think after that, he got the point, you know, um, maybe, I don't know. Yeah. So, but I had to, to actually have said something to him. The last time I actually, oh, here you go. The last time I said something to him was when he had, he called my aunt and my youngest brother together to meet um, downtown. He said to talk about granny and I said, Okay, I knew at that time he was going to tell us when we needed to leave. I already knew because I know him. But I said, okay, he has to have an audience to do this because a real father would just say, hey, baby girl, this is what's happening. We need you to go. You know what I mean? So how how much time do you need so I can plan everything? That's that's a real man, right? Mm -hmm. So he's an audience, though, because this is a narcissist in him. I don't know. But... Uh, he went on to say how um, he has seen his parents work so hard to get that house and Granny held down the house while Granny worked two jobs and he watched all of this. And, you know, he wasn't going to let the house fall to the wayside, all of this. And then they came across the money 
that granddaddy was supposed to get who passed away in 2013. But since granny's still living, she's privy to it, but they're the POA. So they have access to all her stuff. So they're supposed to be renovating the house, right? And they asked us to leave, but he uh, went on to talk about that. And then he asked me about granny's caregiver, whom I was cool with in the beginning, but then she just stopped speaking and started acting funny. So I said, okay, whatever. I didn't do anything to her. So I let her in. I don't say anything. I let her in. As long as she takes care of granny, then we keep, right? Um, so he said, well, what's going on with you and the caregiver? And I said, I don't know what you're about. I don't say anything to her. Um, I let her in. She goes to care for granny. I go back and do whatever I'm doing. He said, well, she says you rude to her. I said, if I don't say anything to her, I'm a rude to her. Mm-hmm. He said, well, you don't have to say anything to anybody to be rude to her. I said, okay, this is going left. You know what I mean? And I said, I'm going to continue to do what I go around the house and make sure Granny's okay, even though you think I don't do anything. And when I said that, it triggered him and he, his whole face contorted. And he said, you don't know what I think. <laughs> so I said, you know what? F this, I'm not doing that. And I got up and I walked away. You know, I didn't give him anything else. My son wanted to come because he knew too what, you know, what was going to happen. And he felt like him being in presence, the things would have gone a little differently, but he needed to work. You know, I said, go to work. I've been there all my life. I, you know. and that's, that's what I did. I got to walk away. He left. He was like, when I, he was like, he was like. So. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I'm sitting here and, um, I'm listening to your story and if you don't mind, I just wanna share um, what you just said about that confrontation with your dad reminded me of my confrontation with my dad when I finally said to him how I felt after all the years of the verbal and the mental and emotional abuse and even physical abuse. Um, towards my mom and to myself. Um, and um, I remember my father was drinking in in the basement and I was living with my parents at the time. Um, and this particular evening he was drinking, he was behind his bar. Um, I was, I took a shower because I was going out with my then boyfriend for dinner or something like that. And I took a shower. So I had a, a towel around me Okay. And um, so there was the hallway, my bedroom, and then like the family room where my dad was. Um, and so I was walking to my room and I, my dad called me and he was like, you know, Tiffy, he used to call me Tiffy, <laughs> Tiffy, come here. And I was like, I just got out the shower. And he was like, well, come here for a minute. So I went to him and it felt uncomfortable because one, I'm in my in a towel. I wasn't in a robe. I was in a towel. Right. And then this is my father, you know, so I kind of, I put my head in the room and kind of, I did enter the room because he was several feet away from me and behind the bar. And, um, he's, I remember him saying to me, you just hate your father, don't you? And I was like, you're drinking. I'm going to go get you. Right. And um, he said, no, you come back here and tell me how you really feel. And that was it. That you was, did. right. That was the moment where I said, you want to know how I really feel? Well, this is the way I feel. I said, mm-hmm. you've been a shitty ass father. <laughs> you know, you've done things to me and my mom that no wife or daughter should have to deal with. Mm-hmm. Um, I said, you haven't been a good father to me. You know, you... I I was your I was your daddy's girl up until a certain point until you started doing things to me, and um, yeah, I don't like you. <laughs> I don't like you at all. And I remember just exploding, and all of those emotions just came out in that moment. 
And I remember the look on his face because I guess he didn't think I was gonna say everything I said. Mm -hmm. um, and with him being to me, and I still feel he was drunk at the time because I don't think he would have approached me in that way if he wasn't, um, I, I laid into him. And I know for a long time, I was angry at my mom because I felt like my mom didn't protect me from him. And after that, I was upset. I went and talked to my mom upstairs in her room and told her what had just happened. And she's looking at me and giving me this strange look. And I'm like, why are you looking at me like that? So I found out after, this was maybe when I was 21, 22 years old and what happened between me and him, the, the physical part of the abuse. Um, I was 16, 17. So for about four years, I had this, this feeling towards my mom of not being protected. Cause I went into foster care and everything. My dad beat me up, blacked my eye, bust my lip and all this kind of stuff. And I went, when I went to work, not knowing I had a black eye, the woman that I worked with actually took me home and called the police. And by that time I had a black eye and I actually, um, you know, I had a black eye by the time I got to her house within maybe a two hour period. And um, she became my foster mom. I was out of the house for a year and I found out that day, four years later, that my dad had told my mom that day that he beat me up like a man. It wasn't no beat me, giving me a beating, like a spanking. It was, he beat me up, kicked me in the ribs and everything. So, yeah, I, yeah, exactly. And I found out that day that my dad had told my mom that I got smart with him and that he hit me or something, but not to the degree that he actually did. But my issue was my mom never came and asked me either. She never came to check on you. She never even asked you about it. The look mm -hmm. at you, are you okay? He told me what happened. No. So whatever story he spun her, she believed. And all the time, I'm thinking that she knew the extent of what happened. And she didn't even come to court when they assigned me to foster care. She didn't even come to court because of whatever story he gave her. Um, and so she didn't know about the physical abuse. She didn't know about the 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 the, the sexual part of what happened. Um, she learned it that day okay. from me. Okay. And um, that so that was a, a moment for not only me between okay. my father and I, but also for my mom and myself. And when I told her, she went downstairs and confronted him and basically said what she had to say to him as well. Um, and that was a turning point for me, was like, no, I'm an adult now. You're not going to treat me like crap and you're not going to pretend as if nothing ever happened between us, you know? So what you shared about that moment, you know, at your granny's house, you know, was like, it, re it made me remember that moment between my father and I, and I guess for, and I'm assuming for you that that was a moment for you too with your dad, where you let him know in some way, or was that the moment? Was that the moment where you basically said enough is enough, or was there another moment? And can you share that moment if it wasn't then? I haven't had that moment. I haven't had a chance to say to him what I want to say. I haven't okay. had a chance to tell him how big of a piece of shit I think he is still to this day. Um, he and my mother have both remarried. Um, he, uh, they still communicate and I'm not sure why, um, but I feel like he did such a job on her that she is still afraid of him, even though she's married to somebody. Um, and it's disheartening. I can't 
talk to her right now because I have to get myself together and I have to be able to meet her where she is. She's 73, 74. Mm-hmm. And that point, there may not be a change. There may not be a healing or or any of that. You may not be willing to open that, that box, you know, at this point in her life. So in order for me, I do understand, in order for me to have communication with her, there are going to have to be boundaries that are set. And the first thing is we don't talk about him because that's that's a, a topic of contention. It shouldn't be, but it is. And so because it is, what I'm not going to do is keep going back and forth with you about him when we both know what he's done. We both know what he said. We Actions speak louder than words all your life. I don't care what anybody says. Um, you hear what people say, but you watch what they do. You watch they react, you watch how they move. And he showed me all my 52 years of life. He me, I'm done. I can't do anything else with him. Um, when I got this apartment uh, with me and my son, you know, I literally did the walkthrough with the, with the leasing agent in the office. And I literally sat down in front of the fireplace and just cried. It was just it's a relief like no other. Um, and so now for me, where I really thought that I was beginning to heal, my healing really begins now. You know, my healing really begins now because I can absolutely eliminate him. You right. Know? And that's because you're no longer at his mom's house. Exactly. You don't have to interact with him at all unless you choose to. Exactly. Um, so your relationship with your mom, for you, you said right now you can't talk to her as well. Is that because she's not acknowledging what happened? Is it because she's not acknowledging what happened to you? What, what is, what is behind that? Because she will ask me or she will say to me, I don't understand how you feel about your father like you feel, Erica. Okay. You know? The provider, never homeless. We might not have been homeless. Sorry. We're sent, no, you're fine. We we were sent to go back and live with granny and granddaddy two or three times as a whole family unit. You know what I'm saying? So you might not consider that homeless, but we were in somebody else's house. I don't know what else to call it. You know what I mean? Um, we didn't have a home of our own. And we may have been at granddaddy and granny's house for each spent maybe a year, you know, maybe a year, but it was at least two or three times we had to go stay with them as a family, everybody. Including your dad? Yep. Okay. okay. Well, what I can say, um, you know, just from being in, um, you know, growing up in a home that was not healthy, um, you know, feeling that resentment against my mom for several years. And then, you know, I was able to, after that explosion between Mm -hmm. me and my dad, I didn't speak to him for about two or three years. But when I did speak to him again, it was completely different. Um, so he wasn't too drunk because he knows what I said to him <laughs> and he got it. He got the right. point. Right. right. Um, and even though till he passed away, he didn't admit that one particular thing that has affected me the most. And that was the sexual part, not saying that my father had sex with me. I'm not saying that, but the things that he said and the way he touched me were inappropriate for a father. Um, That was really hard for me because that was the specifics of everything he did that I felt damaged and hurt me the most. That one piece that he wouldn't acknowledge 
but he did apologize to me for, you know, hurting me and being a part of why I ended up in crappy relationships and so forth. So he did take responsibility for part of it. And I had to get to the point where I had to forgive him for all of it. And it wasn't really for him. It was for me. Yeah, yeah. it was for you. And yeah. I have to forgive myself for even staying in it. I have to forgive myself for allowing him to do what he did for so long. I have I have to forgive myself. Um, forgiving him. I can. Um, I do feel I am one of those type of people if if I cut you off I would like to tell you why so that I don't you don't do it to anybody else. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, I just want to tell him how I feel about him. He's not going to change. Okay. Mm -hmm. I get that. Right. But I want him to hear it from me. Right. You know. Mm -hmm. um, but with, I have to be ready for that. I have to be mentally prepared for that. I have to be stronger than what I am right now because whatever his reaction is, I need to maintain this now, regardless. And I can honestly tell you I'm not there. Yeah, and that's okay. It really is. Um, starting with yourself is a really big step in you know, healing and moving forward. And you don't, Ever, okay, hold on one second, sweetheart. Okay, okay. Um, okay, I'm sorry. So, um, starting with you and and starting with that forgiveness for you, um, is a is a big a big step and I'm I'm happy that you are on that journey to be able to do it because honestly you don't owe him anything you don't owe him forgiveness you don't owe him he's your father he should have never our fathers are our first loves our first experience with love from men and so it's no wonder that you got into a marriage that was um, violent and abusive because that's what you knew and that's what you were brought up on by your father. And unfortunately, your mom enabled it, unfortunately, um, and, and kind of still is by not acknowledging it. They and all, they all, even my aunt who I really get along with, um, that's his, his sister. She, she does it. And, and I told her, I said, you continue to enable him, his shenanigans. I don't, I don't get it. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And that's sad because when you have a family who is protecting an abuser, then you don't have a safe haven. You don't have anyone in the family that you can confide in. I know my relationship with my sisters changed when I um, went into foster care because I told the truth and told the police officer and the caseworker what my father had been doing for years. And one of my sisters threatened me and she was my favorite sister. And until this day, our relationship has never been the same. So when you don't feel protected by the people that are supposed to protect you, then it's very hard, you know, for you to um, feel safe with anybody. You don't, and it and it leaves you with what it has left me with with a lot of knee jerk reactions, always on, always on high alert, kind of mm -hmm. thing, listening, always, you know, what's going on, what's happening, um, you know, and. And that's why I said in the beginning, 
had to explain to my mother the earth that you know is the reactive one that was created in a house of faith. She still, it goes mm -hmm. like right over, you know what I mean? Um, and right. with that being said, no, with my husband, it was way worse. The abuse was way worse. Um, so I literally stepped into mm -hmm. um, something, something way worse, you know, and I could easily blame my father, but I don't myself accountable he showed me who he was and i still went with him mm -hmm. you know um so i i made bad you know, as i made bad choices because of what i seen and what i thought was okay you know um after in my marriage i lost my person because when i was pregnant with this one But don't put your hands on me because I'm not missing. I'm not losing. So uh, he, at that point, he kind of left and went his own way. And I came back to North Carolina. Like, um, yeah. So what are you doing for you right now? What is Erica doing to heal, to forgive herself, to um, move past the pain. What are you doing now, currently? You know, I try for myself. I have to say nothing. I don't know. I I relax. I try to mellow out. I try to ease my mind. I try to make my new place. I'm trying to think of creative ways to make it my own. So when I sit here, I know that it's mine. You know. Um, that's kind of my challenge right now. I haven't really gone into anything else. I meditate, but I'm going to on a regular um, probably even two or three times a day. Um, but I'm, I, there's no, I don't have an excuse. I don't have an excuse. Um, it's just something that I need to put in my so that it works. Yes. Um, part of, you know, being a, um, a survivor is, is switching from that mental state of being a victim and being able to admit to yourself that you are, are were a victim of childhood abuse and domestic violence, domestic abuse in your marriage. And then a lot giving yourself that place to be able to forgive yourself and to also settle that unfinished business um, that it sounds like you still haven't had the opportunity to do or have not been ready to do. And that's okay because everything happens when you're ready. No one can force you into doing anything. No one can force you into talking to your dad. No one can force you into, you know, making your mom understand so forth and so on, because some things they have to take accountability for, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But starting with self um, is hard work as it is. It is. Sometimes looking at self and looking in the mirror and, and seeing where we have to be accountable for ourselves and and we have to forgive ourselves. Um, as a child, you you don't owe your child, your inner child forgiveness because your inner child was at no fault. Exactly. At all. Your, your, your inner child did nothing to deserve to be talked to, belittled, disrespected, um, hurt, abused. Your, your inner child does not owe you or anybody else anything because you were a child. Exactly. But as an adult, you know, we do make um, decisions that might not have been healthy. We get into relationships that we know are very familiar to what we just came from, but they feel normal and safe to us. And part of that is 
the, that was the norm. That's what you grew up in. What it felt like. Yeah, that was the norm. You you grew up in that environment. You saw your mom get hit. You saw your mom be put down. You saw your mom go through all this. You endured all those things. Your brothers endured those things. So, you know, in one as aspect, your adult you has this, you know, responsibility to self because now you're an adult. But until you can forgive that child, for, you know, whatever you have from your childhood that you're holding on for that inner child until you can, that inner child can forgive herself. And when that inner child can understand that you were not at fault for anything that your father did or your mom did or allowed and everyone around you, your aunts, your family or whatever, that was not your responsibility because you were the child. You were supposed to be protected by all of these adults in your life, and you yep. weren't. That's not your fault. That's on them. But I'm also going to say to you is not to be so hard on yourself for your adult self, because your adult self had not resolved your child self. Okay. So don't be so hard on yourself to hold back that forgiveness and to hold back that inner peace that you probably are longing for. And don't, your, your present self and your 21 self, your 25 self, your 30 self, your 35 self, up until the point where you said enough is enough, yes. you were still a victim. So now that you are your present self and Erica has had enough of her <laughs> past self and Erica has said, you know what? I don't have to take this shit from nobody, not even my daddy or my mom or my aunt or whoever. Whoever, yeah. Now, now you're responsible and accountable for yourself because now you're shifting your mind from being a victim. That I am. That I and am. And now you can start learning to forgive yourself because now you have acknowledged that enough is enough. And I don't, you don't want to be a victim anymore. Nope. And the thing is, you know, my saying is now, Tiffany is like a faithful warrior, you know? Life created I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Say that again. Life created a warrior. Yes. You know, and that's pretty much where I'm at. You know, like it will not happen again. You know, I will fight for it. I will fight for my peace. I will fight to keep you out of my life if you're coming in with the same nonsense. Mm -hmm. You know, I will. Um, I'm, I'm so cautious and so guarded as if, I mean, I pretty much have been that way all my life kind of a loner and kind of guarded it's so bad now i mean it, you know some guys try to talk to you and it's like well you you are really like <laughs> mm -hmm. you cards up like intact like mm -hmm. and some don't even try and i'm okay with either one you know mm -hmm. what i mean okay because i'm gonna be honest about it you know i'm gonna tell you what i'm not ready for you know mm -hmm. i'm you what I'm not going to accept. I'm going to tell you what I will accept. And I'm going to tell you what I have to offer, you know, mm -hmm. and I ask you, what can you bring to the table? You know, um, because if we all got to eat, we all got to put in, we're grown. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, and, and being fed and not just the physical way of eating food, talking about spiritually fed, mm -hmm. you know, positive vibes, uh, encouragement, you know, um, fed, you know, mm -hmm. um, so everybody has to bring something, something to the table. And, um, you know, that's hard to find nowadays as well, mm -hmm. but that's okay too, because in my mind, since it hasn't come forth to me, I'm not ready for it. I know that there's still a lot of work I got to do on me. Mm -hmm. So, okay with being by myself right 
okay mm-hmm. with being alone. You know, my son works long hours all the time by myself. I'm so good at you know. Mm-hmm. Um, and just kind of taking the time to just do me, whatever that is, you know. Yeah. So um I'm ready, you know, I'm ready. And that is perfectly okay. You don't have to be in a relationship to be healthy and happy. I think that's where some some women and men, you know, lose themselves because they feel like they have, have to have somebody. But I can tell you being a survivor and being an advocate and you being a warrior is that you have earned the right to say what you are and are not going to accept. You have that right because you are strong and you are a warrior and you have survived. And so you have the right to say, you know, hey, this is this is my boundaries, this is my hard no, and this is what I will accept. But in the same aspect is, and this is something that I went through for years, is it's okay to be strong and it's okay to put those boundaries in place and it's okay to say what you will and will not accept. But just be careful not to push people away that really mean mean you no harm and really want your 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 best interest. And sometimes when we're being strong and we're being advocates and we're being warriors and we we have this newfound Whew, right, right. <laughs> we tend to push people away because we're finding ourselves again and we're trying to learn to love ourselves again and we're trying to figure out who we are and so we don't want to get hurt anymore we want to make sure that people know that we're strong and we don't want to get hurt anymore and this is what it's going to be but sometimes when we do that we push away people um that really want to be a part of your journey and support you. So um, I would just encourage you because it, it because I'm only, and this is speaking from experience because I've done it. Okay. I've, I've had good men that have come into my life that I pushed away because they were too nice, too good, too whatever. And I was just like, whoa, I don't know what this is about. You know, you're not, you're not cussing me out. You're not, you know, you're not hitting me. You're not cheating on me. You're not da da da. da. Mm, I don't know what this is. And right. It's the question the right thing to do. Right. 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 So long we question the right things. Right. <laughs> right. Right. And so you know, I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm married now, and I'm, I'm happy, but I really had some really great opportunities to be with some really great people, but I wasn't ready for it because I'm going to be honest, I didn't feel I deserved it, number one. And then two, it was boring. Like you ain't, we ain't cussing out each other every day and, and we ain't having makeup sex and all that kind of stuff, you know, because it, it was, it was healthy and I didn't know what the heck healthy was yeah. until I said enough is enough. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I'm not I, ready. I'm okay. I'm yeah. okay with the process. You know, I've been advised so many times, be patient with the process, be patient with yourself, you know? Yeah. Yes. And the, the biggest thing right there is being patient with myself, you know, and, and being tolerant of, you know, now I'm, I'm to the point where, you know, if it, it becomes overwhelming or whatever, um, I take a time out. I tell everybody, time out. Mm-hmm. And I'll get right back to you, you know. Yeah. Um, but because I push, I push, there's a lot going on. And, um, you know, the, the good thing is I'm, I'm, I'm in a better place. I'm out of the situation. I can focus on what I need to do for myself and where I want to go and the things that I want to accomplish. And um, I'm not interested in like nobody knows where I stay. Nobody knows mm-hmm. where mm-hmm. you know. Um I did allow my aunt to come by Saturday because she had granny with her and I wanted to see my granny. Mm-hmm. So I was able to see granny so I did I told my aunt I said I appreciate it if you don't tell nobody but if you do and they come over here they get what they get. that's all I yeah. um so 
How is, and I didn't ask this, how is your relationship with your, with your granny? Does she acknowledge her son's behavior? What she said to me, because she's in advanced stage dementia at this point, mm -hmm. what she has said to me before, because I have spoken to her about it before she got to this event, is uh, she didn't like the way I was talking about it. Got mad that it's still her son. And okay. I was very, I was very blunt. And she said, I know he's a demon child, but he's mine. I said, and you need to be the one to love him. Because mm -hmm. I you know. Um, and I never ever said anything to her about that. I haven't I haven't said anything to her. I focused on my relationship with her because at the end of the day, her and Brenda were more to me and my siblings than our parents because he was busy running around throwing every Betsy Jane and Sue and she <laughs> not to get beat when he comes home because he don't want to come home. See, the issue is they got pregnant with me in college unexpectedly. And at mm -hmm. that point in time in 69, the thing was you married. You mm -hmm. know, nothing he wanted to do. First two years, he kind of sucked it up and dealt with it. And then he was like, what? I'm not doing this anymore. I'm around the way. And that's when things went haywire. Um, I, I, I get his anger and I get his frustration. I understand that he was only 19. My mother was 21. You feel me? So mm -hmm. I get that still does not justify it and it doesn't make it right. It doesn't make it, you know, right. you should have left. We would right. have better off if you right. had just, to be quite honest. You know, I, I think um, the other day on Facebook about a lady who didn't have a father and into the wrong relationships as well because our father wasn't there. And I'm like, yo, my father was here. I mm -hmm. did this because he wasn't the right kind of father. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't know how to be, or even maybe even didn't want to be, you mm -hmm. know, a father. He just kind of got put in that predicament. But, you know, um, I'm like, I'm here as a result of y'all screw ups. <laughs> right. Okay. If you have one, them and you wouldn't see me. <laughs> right, right. Yeah. What are we talking about here? You know right. what I'm saying? I don't get the support from them about anything, about my book, about any of the accomplishments that I'm making. So with me making moves the way that I want to make moves and doing what I want to do and what I'm comfortable with, neither one of them need to be around me right Because mm -hmm. I have positive energy and love that I can get from the genuine people that I choose to have around me. Right, right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, good for you. Um, I am so um, proud of you and I am honored that you chose to share your story first with uh, me on the, in the private room. I have a feeling you're going to be sharing more. Um, you know, the more comfortable you get, um, the further you are on your journey. Um, I know right now I've asked you to read my new book that I'm planning on publishing, um, Earn Your Wings, a 30-day uh, journey from survivor to advocate. Yeah. And um, I'm just very grateful. Um, I also would love to be your coach, mentor through your journey um, because I, I really see so much in you. And I see a lot of me in you, um, but I also see that you don't have the natural supports that you deserve to have from your family. Um, and that's a shame. And that's not a shame for you. That's a shame for them. Right. Um, and I would love to be that that support for you. Um, love that. I would love that. I welcome oh. open arms. Thank you for that. I appreciate it. I really do. It means a lot. <laughs> it means a lot, and I appreciate it. Yeah. Something was drawing me to you. So here I am. You're stuck with me now. <laughs> it's all good. We'll it do. Yes, we are. We're going to make it do what it do. Exactly. Yes, we are. Um, would you uh, like to share your poem that you shared with us last week? Sure. 
Sure, sure, sure. Give me one second. Just um, before I repeat my poem, anyone who's interested in the book, if you don't mind me saying, mm -hmm. uh, go to infinitedimensions22.com and it's on sale for pre-order there. The official virtual book signing will be held on November the 8th. November the 8th, and I will keep you guys posted. I'm sorry. Almost here. Here we go. All right, you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Okay. This one's called Father's Choice. Your pride, your joy, your only daughter, your words hurt more than the slaps to the face. Your lack of respect stabs my heart. Your lies wound my soul, dampen my spirit, allowing me to accept way less than I deserve in all areas of my life. You were supposed to be my goat my lifeline to a greater man, an example of the choice of a man that's worthy of me and all that I have to offer. You were to support career choices in my life, not yours. Whatever you missed in your life has nothing to do with the choices I make in mine. Your physical, verbal, and emotional abuse have affected all areas of my life and the choices I've made. I've struggled to try to make you proud of me. Instead, there was no pride, no support, no unconditional love, just ridicule, words to tear down my soul and spirit. I'll try no more. You no longer exist to me. I must save myself, rid me of all toxins and toxic people. It's unfortunate for you. You've truly lost out on a beautiful daughter inside and out. You've missed her growth into maturity, into womanhood. Thank you for the strength you gave. Thank you for showing me the type of person and parent not to be. Thank you for showing me how love is not supposed to be. You may have a nice house in a nice neighborhood. You may drive a nice SUV. You may have a nice bank account with a good income. But what I have are more riches than your eyes can see and your mind can obtain. I'm genuine. I'm caring, loving, and generous. I'm good to those that are good to me. Those that aren't, I leave alone. I take ownership for my mistakes and faults. I apologize with sincerity, making sure not to make the same mistakes. I fear God and his truth, his power, his forgiveness, his mercy and grace, his protection, his love. Because of this, I'm unmeasurably wealthy. So my questions to you are, how wealthy are you really? And where do you stand with your God? Mm. Powerful, powerful, even more powerful knowing your story. Thank you for sharing. I really appreciate you again, sharing your story for the first time with us um, and allowing me to support your journey. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing all that you accomplished um, going forward. And um, I'm just, I feel, I feel like you're on the right track. And this was, one of many first steps because you're going to take a lot of steps <laughs> a lot of steps uh so i hope you got your walking shoes on i hope you got your walking shoes on. <laughs> right and your boxing gloves yes so always yeah <laughs> or i got the shoes unfortunately <laughs> yeah 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 um i'm i'm very proud of you Tell everybody again how they can find you and how they can get your book. Okay. Um, again, my name is Erica Meadows. You can find me on Facebook at Arthur Erica A. Meadows. Um, on Instagram, it's uh, Infinite Dimensions 22 and Infinite Dimension 22. Um, and the book can be found on Infinite Dimensions 22.com. Infinite Dimensions with an X. 22, the numbers two and two.com. Very nice, very nice. So we are um, at the end of our interview, the okay. first of many. Yes. So thank you again for joining us and thank you for closing us out with your poem. Everyone, everyone, and everyone, please make sure that you go and pre order her book, Dimensions. And thank you and have a great night. Thank you for having me. You're mm -hmm. so welcome.
And I'll talk to you very, very soon. <laughs> All right, love. Thanks. All right. Thank you.